She told me everything. She had pictures. She had everything. She was in hiding for 12 years. We convinced her to come out. We convinced her to talk to us. Um, it was unbelievable what we had. Clinton. We had everything. I, I tried for three years to get it on to no avail, and now it's all coming out, and it's like these new revelations, and I freaking had all of it. I, I, I'm so pissed right now. Like, every day I get more and more pissed because I'm just like, oh my God. We, it was, um, what, what we had was unreal. Brad Edwards, the attorney, three years ago saying, like, aunt, like we, there will come a day where we will realize Jeffrey Epstein was the most prolific pedophile this country has ever known. And I had it all three years ago. Today we announced charges against Ghislaine Maxwell for helping Jeffrey Epstein sexually exploit and abuse multiple minor girls who were as young as 14 years old. We've been discreetly keeping tabs on Maxwell's whereabouts. She was hiding out in a remote part of New Hampshire. FBI agents moved in, arriving in about a dozen cars, a plane flying above to make sure the only way she left was in handcuffs. Who is this Ghislaine Maxwell? Ghislaine Maxwell. Ghislaine Maxwell. Ghislaine Max Maxwell. Gisma Ghislaine, I think it's um, Ghislaine. What do we know about her and that relationship? Ghislaine Maxwell has been described as Epstein's ex-girlfriend and assistant. Identified by multiple Epstein accusers as being his primary co-conspirator. His best friend, according to Epstein, and a socialite who helped connect him with the wealthy and famous. Rich and powerful individuals, including politicians, including celebrities, are nervous about what Ghislaine Maxwell may say. I just wish her well, frankly. Uh, I've met her numerous times over the years. Ghislaine Maxwell will have a lot of time to think about it in her jail cell. Trial isn't set to begin until July of next year. People were beguiled by Ghislaine. She had this charismatic power over people. So who is Ghislaine Maxwell? Who is the girl beneath all of this? Nobody knows. That is little girl, like, you know, you were the youngest. What, what do you feel your parents were expecting you to become? Like all parents, they want their children to be happy. Are you happy? I am happy in the sense that I have many things to be grateful for. But if I have a wish for myself, it's to be able to achieve something. I've followed the story of Ghislaine Maxwell because she was somebody I knew at university. She would stand out because I, and I remember this vividly in terms of her dress sense. She was flashy. Her clothes were new and modern. I remember from early dinners I had with Ghislaine that she was kind of the life of the party. She ran with a fast crowd. And you'd see, you know, movie stars and visiting royalty. Ghislaine was just impossibly fun. Zinging humor. She was able to figure out the comedic potential of everyone at the table. So she could just have you in stitches. And I was intrigued by how extraordinarily well-connected she was. Well, Ghislaine was friends of everybody. 
She was friends with Andrew and Fergie. You want the ocean to be sustainably managed, and that is the message that we... She was involved in charity work. She was always, like, jetting around somewhere, you know, fabulous. She was quite mysterious in a way. You just never really knew exactly what she was doing. She's obviously, like, a good actress because there was this whole other, like, dark world that was going on that was really shocking. This relationship between Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell was really a partnership on a sexual level and a financial level. I work for Ghislaine and Jeffrey in his New York mansion. And I asked Ghislaine what her relationship was with Jeffrey because she appeared to be more like an employer or a coworker. She told me they were married. And then she told me that evening that they weren't actually married, but that they were dating and he was cheating on her. Okay, so what is it? I think that one of the saddest things actually that I've read about the whole thing is in the deposition when she was asked what her relationship with Epstein was and was it a relationship? And she sort of answers saying she wasn't really sure. She was, you know, part friend, part fixer. She was the one who, who would satisfy his every whim. The only boyfriend I've ever heard about was Jeffrey Epstein, who doesn't strike me as a terribly good choice. Today, we announce the unsealing of sex trafficking charges against Jeffrey Epstein. A wealthy money manager whose friends have included presidents and a prince is behind bars in Manhattan tonight. Arrested Saturday night when his private plane arrived back here in the U.S. from Paris. He's alleged to have abused dozens of girls, some as young as 14. We know that he was flying around globally and that this was an international sex trafficking scheme that he had developed in countries and cities around the globe. Ghislaine Maxwell was out in the open once Jeffrey Epstein was arrested. And she felt secure enough to travel the world. And she felt, I think, that her Teflon Don essentially would get away and he would somehow cut a deal and, and, and not have any concerns. Breaking news out of New York, Jeffrey Epstein is dead. The 66-year-old was discovered in his jail cell early this morning. Jeffrey Epstein went to his grave, taking many secrets with him. You have to believe people felt a relief that Jeffrey Epstein was dead. If the public knew the secrets that he knew, it would be shocking. The people who are most devastated by this are the victims because they're not going to be able to see justice in the way they wanted. Do I feel his death was an appropriate punishment? Absolutely not. It gives nobody justice. Their hope now would be if one of his co-conspirators was charged with crimes. He didn't do this alone. He had people working for him, people working with him, and he had people that enabled his entire operation. And number one on that list is Ghislaine Maxwell, who's accused of finding teenage girls for Epstein and his friends. Without Ghislaine, I don't think any of us would have been there, or very few of us, because there was always a woman that, that made it so we could trust. I was initially introduced to Ghislaine, um, and she's who introduced me to Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey had the sickness, but they worked together as a unit. I was brought in by Ghislaine, and at that time, she was the main procurer for Jeffrey. You know, when Jeffrey wanted me, Ghislaine would call me to his bedroom. Ghislaine was always on the phone, organizing things. Ghislaine knew every time she called me, I was going to be raped every time. It was a pyramid scheme of sexual abuse with Jeffrey Epstein at the top, 
Ghislaine is accused of hovering outside school gates, grooming these girls, offering them shopping trips, girly things, presenting herself as the ultimate kind of mother protector and girlfriend. That's what appalls me the most, actually. I mean, that is duplicitous to the most horrific degree. Ghislaine takes a victim and converts the victim into a co-conspirator so that they can then go and branch out and get more victims. Basically, creating an organization. There were lieutenants, there were schedulers, there were fixers. The moment Jeffrey Epstein died, Jelaine Maxwell disappeared. She went underground. Ultimately, Glenn Maxwell is likely scared because she holds the same secrets that Jeffrey Epstein does. She also knows where the bodies are buried. I think the crime she's accused of worse than Epstein's because you think as a woman you absolutely betrayed your sex, your gender. It's astonishing to me. I always believe in the end that the truth will out and that uh, eventually the true story, such as it is, will be people will know more than, than what they currently do. It's, it'll take time. It'll take time, that's all. The woman sitting in a New York prison cell bears absolutely no resemblance to this very confident, moneyed, social girl that I knew. I mean, you sort of think, how on earth could you have got to this place? Robert Maxwell was, quite frankly, a terrifying father. And all the children would have learned early that you had to please daddy. And no matter what cost, he had to be placated, he had to be pleased. So I think to understand Ghislaine Maxwell, you have to start with the father, Robert Maxwell. Two years ago, the name Maxwell was like power, money, everything. What do you feel right now when you're carrying this name? I don't know. You tell me what you think. <laughs> I'm proud of it. And you don't, and you didn't even think for one second to change it or something. No, I love my name. I was born with it, and I'm proud of it, and I shall remain proud of it forever. Once upon a Christmas time, in a big house on a hill, there lived a man his wife and their eight children. And everybody looked up at the hill and said, what a super Christmas I'd have if my father were a millionaire, which Robert Maxwell is. The root of where Ghislaine has ended up today is all to do with her relationship with her father. The family filled the house with their excitement particularly Ghislaine, who's five, and like the baby of any family, has daddy very much under control. I think everything about her relationship with her father led her into her relationship with Epstein. And from what's alleged, becoming the ultimate daddy's girl, socialite, networker, who became the ultimate madam. Did you get some of Daddy's presents? Yes. <laughs> My sister remembers at a very young age going to birthday parties at the Maxwell house, and she remembers the sort of visceral fear of the figure of Robert Maxwell in the background. He genuinely was a, a very difficult, unpleasant and terrifying man. Ghislaine was his youngest child, and she was a Daddy's girl but a daddy's girl with a difference that daddy could turn. And she learnt to navigate a man with a terrible temper. She learnt early to read a powerful man's moods. She had these strange traits of character, which we all know came from Robert Maxwell. Insufferable, ruthless, brazen, fiery, humorless, impatient, intolerant, rude. To how much of that do you plead guilty? I plead guilty to all of it. 
the beginning of an understanding of what kind of man he was is to understand his childhood. Robert Maxwell's original name was Jan Ludwig Hoch. He was born in one of the most impoverished Orthodox Jewish shtetls, in one of the most poorest impoverished parts of Eastern Europe. He didn't have shoes of his own. He shared a pair with one of his sisters. We lived in one room, although we were seven children. We had no fire. We just had nothing. He had a traumatic beginning to his life as a child. Most of his family uh, were wiped out in the Holocaust. I think the experience of extreme poverty and great hardship scarred him for life. Not being poor became an absolute imperative. He had to have money. Which meant having to do all sorts of tricks and crooked business. Anything to prosper, to profit, to survive. Robert Maxwell was a huge survivor, whether from the ghetto in the Eastern Europe or during the Second World War. He was absolutely determined to come to Britain to fight the Nazis. And he was a very brave soldier. But then in post-war Berlin, he was working for British intelligence, but also made links on the other side of the divided city of Berlin with the Russian intelligence service, the KGB, and became a Russian spy too. So he always saw the profit of playing every side because in the end, there was only one side that was himself. Here was a man who'd had to invent himself, who believes that having done it once, he could do it many times over. The masquerade had worked. And so he embraced that for the rest of his life in the business sphere. Maxwell, when he came back to England, renamed himself Robert Maxwell after the Maxwell coffee brand, and then set about to build up his uh, crooked business. Maxwell used links with British intelligence to profit from a German scientific publishing company, where scientists eager to publish their findings gave him their work for next to nothing, and he resold it to the libraries across the world at a huge profit and kept the money for himself. That became a scientific publishing company called Pergamon Press, which was the foundation of his wealth. But in 1969, it was discovered the company was riddled with fraud. The Department of Trade Inquiry criticized his accounting methods and his honesty and branded him unfit to exercise proper stewardship of a public company. It was a huge uh, embarrassment. He faced down investigations and all sorts of prosecutions, but he was able to get away with it and build up his wealth. Mr. Maxwell, what's your reaction to the allegations? I deny them utterly. The point about a con man is never to admit wrong. The moment you admit that you've done wrong, you're finished. The only thing you can do, and you must do, if you're a con man and criminal, is always insist on your innocence. I think that's exactly what Ghislaine is going to do. She will lie and hope to get away with it. Anyone's parents have an influential position on their personality and on their behavior, but with someone who is as dominant and as difficult as Robert Maxwell was, there's, there's no way that he hasn't shaped who she is now. As undoubtedly she was hugely influenced by her father and learned to survive and tolerate a domineering ogre and tyrant of clearly dishonest motives and way of life. You are a billionaire who's got where you are on the backs of working people. You've got nothing in common with the working class. You are a fascist. That's what he was such a bully, and I saw him berate people over a very small matter. Dismiss people over a very small matter. Just give him the message, please, and stop giving us a hard time. He used to slam his hand down on this glass desk like you thought it was going to break and really stare at you over the face and you kept thinking, he is going to hit me now. It certainly sounds like Ghislaine has a temper as well, which I recognise from her father.
the pounding fists on table is behavior that's definitely Maxwell territory. I have a natural instinct for war. And you better have good lawyers and large resources and be on your guard. I think if you're that close to somebody who was clearly so devious and corrupt and you saw what was going on, that behavior becomes normalized. Uh, in her world, powerful men doing despicable things, you, you, you are able to sort of see it and equally remove yourself from it. And after a while, when you grow up with that, it becomes normal. You lose your moral compass. I grew up in Oxford and everyone in Oxford knew who the Maxwells were, but they weren't the Oxford intellectuals. They were a rather more exotic family um, because of Robert's wealth. The house on the hill is an open house the children take their places beside their parents to greet their 200 guests and to enjoy themselves, even Ghislaine. Ghislaine grew up in a very, very wealthy, comfortable um, existence. There was plenty of cash and anything that they wanted, they could have. The family lived at this grand country estate. They had private jets. They had huge parties. It was the high life. They epitomized the high life. But this girl grew up with an abusive father. Ghislaine's brothers, Ian and Kevin, told me that their father was hooked on discipline and on duty. They were the most important things to him. And he ran the household almost like you would run a company. I mean, there were nine children, and he would almost put them on trial. He would fire questions at them, and if they failed to answer them correctly, he would make them assess why they had failed to answer them correctly. And it was, it was humiliation. It was like a public dressing down. He used to subject them to these grillings in front of other people at uh, Sunday lunches. One child would be told to perform, as it were, and he would tell them, speak clearly and concisely, and that would only put them under even more pressure, chastising them, and was not above using corporal punishment, and his wife did not step in to intervene. She was enthralled to him as well. I think it's fascinating that we all know so little about Betty Maxwell, and she was very much seen as the mother in the background. Robert Maxwell had been very close to his mother when we lost in the Holocaust, and clearly um, he was looking for someone who would give him comfort and security, which Betty did. Not only produced an enormous number of children, but organized the home and put up with his appalling behavior. When Robert Maxwell was shouting at all of the children and making them feel awful around the dinner table, their mother was allowing it to happen. She was being the good wife. She was playing the role. She was the enabler, you know, she enabled him. It's very easy to imagine that this experience could influence Ghislaine, that this is what the perfect relationship or the comfortable dynamic is, that there's a powerful demanding person and a woman who helps them. The kids were a unit. Ian and Kevin, when I spoke to them, talked about forming a defensive chess position, that that's how they survived their father. It was like a defensive stance that they took. They interlocked, and that allowed them to withstand Robert's rages. Two days after Ghislaine was born, her eldest brother, Michael, was involved in a very serious car crash, and he was in a coma for the next seven years. So the time when she would have been showered with parental affection, the family were in fact in the middle of, an, of dealing with an enormous crisis. It meant that the early years of Ghislaine's life would have been very much eclipsed by this tragedy. There's a story in her mother, Betty Maxwell's book, where Ghislaine sat on her lap and said, Mummy, I exist. 
And she also said that she thinks that that's the beginning of Ghislaine's eating disorder. Her mother was convinced that even as a toddler, she was already showing signs of anorexia. And they thought that it was to do with attention. It was a way of trying to get attention from her parents. And at that point, Robert and Betty realized that they had been neglecting their daughter completely and tried to make up for this terrible beginning to her life and showered her with love and affection. And of all the Maxwell children, Ghislaine is the only one who was spoiled. They spoiled her as a result of it. So she had everything she wanted in material terms. Ghislaine would definitely have realized at a very early age that money was important to her. Robert Maxwell was more generous and accommodating towards her than the older children. And Ghislaine would definitely have aligned herself more with her father because she has definitely seen wealth as protection. Uh, and we saw that very much later on with Epstein. Ghislaine's story is essentially uh, the story of, you know, daddy's little girl. And it all went horribly wrong when uh, daddy turned out to be a crook. was at Oxford with Ghislaine. It was mid-80s, so it was the height of Princess Diana. Thatcher was in power. It was Gordon Gekko. Green is good. It was the 80s. Even the clothes were flamboyant. We all wore massive shoulder pads and puffs of taffeta. It was a very extravagant era. We were there with Boris Johnson, David Cameron, and you were kind of accepted in that social set if you were from an aristocratic family. Ghislaine wasn't from that background, but she would have been accepted in that social circle because of her father's notoriety and wealth and power spoke volumes in the mid 80s. She really enjoyed being social and having dinner parties. She was very much into the whole social scene. As soon as I met her, what really was striking about her was she was somebody who would kiss you hello and then look over your shoulder to see if there was someone more interesting, more useful, more powerful, more famous to talk to. There's a feeling always of stepping up a league, going to the next influential person, going to the next head of state, the party, the boat, whatever. You absolutely had the sense that she wasn't really present to you and she wasn't really going to connect with you. It was a sense of scanning always to see who could be more influential or useful to her. Ghislaine Maxwell was very happy to be photographed and sometimes would ask me to take pictures of her with someone. but. In particular, if there was a famous person she was with. I lived in Oxford and I started photographing some of the exclusive student parties for a few years in the early 80s. It was high society. Ghislaine Maxwell tend to be at nightclub openings and charity events that you paid to buy a ticket. But she was moving gradually more into a, um, a higher society role. I think she seemed very animated. She seemed to be enjoying herself every time I saw her. She seemed to have a very nice life. Probably some people disapproved of her. Her father already had a bad reputation. I first met Ghislaine shortly after I'd returned to do my master's degree. And I remember being at some sort of a party. I think it was probably a drinks party. As soon as I'm introduced, I'd, I'd barely spoken to her. And she said, will you take me out to dinner? And I found that quite surprising. Ghislaine certainly wasn't my type, and I wouldn't have asked her on a date myself, but she was interesting. The way she asked me to take her out was unexpected and different, and I thought, what have I got to lose? <laughs> Oxford was a very small town, and I didn't particularly want people to know who I was 
going out to dinner with. So I picked a restaurant seven miles outside Oxford. If I was there for one reason, it probably was to get to know her a bit, and one would have hoped vice versa. But the only subject she really had to talk about was her father, how proud she was being her father's daughter, how she could pick up any national newspaper on any day and find at least one story about him in it. The impression I got from Ghislaine at that dinner was someone who's actually rather insecure. I felt there was a veneer of confidence and maturity, but that a great deal of her persona was wrapped up in being Robert Maxwell's daughter. <laughs> Robert Maxwell wanted wealth, but he also wanted power and influence. And owning newspapers was a way of, of wielding power. So he bought the Mirror Group. And that included Britain's most popular newspaper that time, the Daily Mirror. The Mirror newspapers are at a disadvantage at present, owing to the lack of the dynamic leadership of the kind that I believe that I could provide. Maxwell was an extraordinarily difficult person to work for. I didn't sleep much during the year I worked for him. He liked to interfere. He tried to have his name as often in the paper as possible. And also, he could use the newspaper for blackmail. I mean, very often he would threaten people that if they didn't do what he wanted, he would then publish an expose in his newspaper. That was a favoured um, tactic of his. When I worked at the Daily Mirror, we had a strange man who was the in-house detective. And he admitted to me that many of the phones were bugged, including the editor's phone. Ghislaine saw that if you kept the patriarchy happy, you were protected, and she was reared to please Daddy. Ghislaine wasn't a businesswoman, but Ghislaine's job was to represent Robert Maxwell when he was in different parts of the globe. I don't know what she would have said her job was. The other children actually had jobs within the empire, like proper jobs, especially Ian and Kevin whereas she seems to have occupied this strange social slash business role that's quite hard to define even for her father. But he bought her a football club for crying out loud. I think because he lived in Oxford, Maxwell thought, oh, well, I'll buy Oxford Football Club because it was for sale. And then he put Elaine in charge of the football club. I don't imagine for a moment she was interested in football. I take the job of director very seriously. I don't think I would have accepted the job if it was just a matter of being a figurehead. The Football League's first elected lady director is still, in fact, a student. She's at Balliol College in Oxford, studying French and history. With her father having taken control at the manor, her place on the Oxford board was confirmed at the recent annual meeting. A photograph will fill the space on the boardroom wall before the start of the new season. It's Ghislaine's particular responsibility to generate further interest in the club among young supporters. And any suggestion that her appointment is a gimmick doesn't carry much favour. I really do hope to contribute something positive to the club, both in terms of uh, improving the social events, maybe between the players and the supporters, and in helping in whatever small way that I can in bringing a more sort of family atmosphere to the club. I think there was a sense of impunity among certain members of the family, definitely Robert Maxwell himself, and it's there evident too in Ghislaine. That sense that rules are for other people. We do what we want to do and let the devil take the hindmost. And it's quite easy to see why Ghislaine, who had this father fixation, who was a daddy's girl, would then move on to this other equally satanic father figure and do his bidding at whatever the cost.
there's a similarity between Ghislaine's uh, affectionate love for her father and Jeffrey Epstein. They have a lot in common. Both of them show uh, strains of character in which there is very little empathy and very little warmth uh, and there is an absolute survival instinct. They were both men who were manipulators and who were out to get what they needed and what they wanted at any cost. Like Robert Maxwell, Jeffrey dreamed of riches from the little two-bedroom apartment he grew up in in Coney Island. Jeffrey Epstein came from a family that was working class. They didn't really have much money. He had to hustle his way into the life that he ended up having. Jeffrey was a nerdy kid who told classmates back at Lafayette High School, I'm going to be rich when I grow up. And, you know, they all kind of laughed at him. But Jeffrey had a mind that kind of worked like a computer. And he was determined to make money. And he was going to accomplish that on Wall Street. It was a time when Wall Street was huge. And Jeffrey was seemingly on the fringes of it, but there was no computer on his desk. There was no back room of people trading. It wasn't clear what the source of the money was. The big question is, where did Jeffrey's money come from? I think you have to go back to Bear Stearns, which is really where he received his first taste of money. Bear Stearns saw this potential in a guy who didn't know a stock from a bond, but thought he was a brilliant mathematician and would do extremely well but he was thrown out at Bear Stearns based on his violations of the rules for misconduct. And he was kind of blackballed in the United States. But it actually turned out to be a windfall for Jeffrey to leave there because, you know, the, the riches that awaited him exceeded well beyond anything that uh, he could have uh, gained on Wall Street. Jeffrey then dashed over to London where he met Douglas Lease. Douglas Lease was an international arms merchant, and he was able to mold Jeffrey into this world of arms dealing. This was an area of the financial world that was very shady, and the money at this point was pouring in. I met Jeffrey Epstein. He was a young, rather good-looking Jewish boy from New York that somehow appeared in Robert Maxwell's office. And I used to see him quite often in the office. Jeffrey Epstein presented himself to Robert Maxwell as a financial expert. Jeffrey Epstein was charming. He was charismatic and could read the person he's dealing with and understand what that person wants to hear. He was a mastermind of how to manipulate and seduce people. So Robert Maxwell entered into a deep relationship in business with Jeffrey Epstein. At that particular time, Jolene Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein met in London. At the introduction by Robert Maxwell. I mean, no one knew who he was at the time, but in England, they knew who she was. Epstein appreciated that she gave him a veneer of respectability and um, introduced him to the upper echelons of English society. I think she chose someone very like her father. But then equally, it makes you wonder how much their conversations in the early days, he might have been figuring out how her father operated and doing many of the same tricks back. It looked like there were a couple. At least she thought they were a couple. 
Jeffrey Epstein was a multiple fruit lander. I saw him in London with other women as well. And Jeffrey Epstein used Jelaine Maxwell to get further into Robert Maxwell's empire. And Robert was busy trying to build up his empire. He wanted everything. He wanted to be the biggest, the best. It was unstoppable. He always looked for ways in which assets would help him build up not only his fortune, but also his profile and personality. And once Rupert Murdoch had the New York Post, he became quite famous in America. Maxwell wanted to do the same. He wanted to rival Murdoch in the most important city in the world, New York. And buying the New York Daily News gave him that chance. Mr. Maxwell comes to town. Maxwell is Robert Maxwell, a flamboyant British press lord. And the reason he's come is to take over the Daily News. He said he bought it for the challenge of turning a loser into a winner. In the context of the New York Daily News takeover, the advance guard, as it were, was for Robert Maxwell to send Ghislaine. He uses her, sends her out first to charm people. And she railed against that. Why, you know, Kevin's got a proper job. Ian's got a proper job. Why can't I have a proper job? I ran into her at a party and she told me that she was working for her father. And it seemed like she was a kind of a connector for her father of people with power and influence in the city who it would be useful for him to know. She would be somebody who could be used in social terms. It's like using the woman that's closest to you for your own ends. And he preferred to have her on his arm than he did Betty. He pulls away from Betty, and now Ghislaine is his right-hand person and is a very good companion. She, she fits that role very well for him. You get this sense that in psychological terms that she was the Oedipal winner. She was the most important figure in his life. I think it's really telling that he named his boat after her. From Ghislaine's point of view, buying the Daily News was infinitely more important than for Robert Maxwell. He already had access to the White House. He already had access to all sorts of, all the bankers and the rest. But Elaine was able to use that advantage to her own success. She could then use that newspaper to promote herself in the city and meet everybody. She was the tycoon's daughter. That's when her world fell apart. That's when everything she thought she could rely on, her structure, her security, her protection, absolutely fell apart. You know, the bottom fell out of her world. Group newspapers announces with deep regret that Robert Maxwell is missing at sea. He had lost overboard on his motor yacht, the Lady Ghislaine. The gathering of Robert Maxwell's family was completed with the arrival of the daughter after whom he had named his fateful yacht. For Ghislaine, that was the most seismic event of her life. His body was found floating in the water, and there were three post-mortems, and no one could agree on what the cause of death was. So there's a lot of conspiracy around um, the circumstance of his death. He committed suicide. He was rubbed out by assassins from a two-man submarine, poisoning, strangling, even overwork. Suddenly, Ghislaine is dealing with the media. 
I mean, again, that shows Ghislaine's status in the family pecking order, that she was very much like the sort of wife and heir apparent. She is like the bereaved widow going to see what had happened. There were reports that she arrived on the boat and had personal documents and important documents shredded. Thank all the many. A very reliable Daily Mirror reporter said that he saw Ghislaine shredding documents. That shows that she would have had quite an involvement with the business to have known what documents to shred. I want also to thank the press. So you have the public face in which she's handling the press and inquiries very well, and then you have the private shredding of documents. This was a loyal daughter ensuring that whatever fate her father had befallen, she wasn't willing to let light in on the darkness. Undoubtedly, they didn't want other people to know what the papers revealed about uh, Maxwell's business. Miss Maxwell, may we ask you something uh, on behalf of the family about what conclusions the family well, all, all these things will be revealed. I just that was the statement. Just thank you very much. Thank you. There was suspicion and rumours around Robert Maxwell's business dealings. A lot of people hated him, and um, he would have picked up a lot of enemies along the way. You know, in an interview Ghislaine gave about seven years after his death, she said she thought it was murder, but there's never been any evidence to back that up. What do you feel? What happened to him? You'll never know, so you'll never be 100% sure of exactly what took place. The only thing I'm sure of is that he did not commit suicide. Would you agree with somebody that he might commit suicide? Because most, most of the people say he would never. Never. It's never entered my mind. He wasn't suicidal at all? No. This is not possible. He would never have done that. Mm -hmm. He's a fighter. He's a totally born fighter. No way. Robert Maxwell, who paid little attention to his Jewish origins until near the end of his life, asked to be buried in Jerusalem, and the entire Israeli establishment came to pay tribute. Prime Minister Shamir, Defense Minister Ahrens, Housing Minister Sharon. By 1991, Robert Maxwell was a major personality in Israel. He was very close to the Israeli government. He rediscovered his uh, Jewish roots, and he felt very at home there. So it was natural for them to want to bury him in the most sacred place in Jerusalem. After his death, the pilot of the personal jet told me that on the way back, as they left Jerusalem and flew back to England, some of them were unbelievably relieved and happy, was a brief moment of freedom for them. They thought, finally, we've got control of our own lives. Uh, of course, they were mistaken. The mystery of Robert Maxwell multiplied today with the collapse of his publishing empire. His crumbling empire is missing $1.2 billion. That's billion. Employees of the Mirror newspapers learned that more than a billion dollars had been siphoned off from their pension fund. When Robert Maxwell died and the financial mismanagement of the Mirror Group became apparent, it became one of the biggest stories in British modern history. British newspapers are now having a field day reporting the scandal in the lead Maxwell's own Daily Mirror, desperately trying to solve the mystery of what its publisher did with the money. He had taken £400 million from the pensioners at the Mirror Group. 
Maxwell stole not just the pension funds, but he stole lots of other companies. His total takings were at least two billion pounds in 1991. So in current terms, you're talking of a fraud of at least five to 10 billion pounds sterling. And the Maxwell name was dirt and synonymous with fraud. For Ivy Needham, this is one memory she would rather not have. Her former boss, Robert Maxwell and family. Robert Maxwell robbed us. He took our bank book, took the money out, and that was it. At the time, there were accusations that Ghislaine's brothers were somehow involved with the financial malfeasance because they were Robert Maxwell's lieutenants in the business. And it was unclear at that point whether um, Ghislaine knew of it or had been involved in any way, but it was a highly stressful situation for Ghislaine. Kevin and Ian Maxwell were targeted by the police. Within minutes, more police arrived. And then Kevin Maxwell appeared, flanked by officers from the City of London Police. The Maxwell family came completely ostracised and vilified totally persona non grata. Maxwell's sons handed over their bankrupt inheritance today to administrators who will sell off the empire. Uh, clearly, we didn't know everything, and clearly uh, he had a, uh, a style of business uh, where probably he ran on need to know as opposed to sharing information all the time. The large part of the scandal is what the press has made of it. It's so stupid. It's nothing to do with the man. The man was a totally exceptional man. Most people who say the most appalling things about him have never met him in their life. They don't know who they're talking about. It was bizarre to hear her talking about um, her late husband. She said, he was such a wonderful husband, such a wonderful father, which seemed very different from all the reports we'd been reading in the papers. It must have been a devastating shock to Ghislaine. One moment she's at the very top of the society and the next moment the Maxwell name is mud. You don't feel that she retreated to the bosom of her family, to her siblings, to her mother, who was still alive, to support her. It's like almost she was orphaned from that moment because she didn't have the all-powerful daddy watching her back. The rug was pulled from underneath her and she's wondering, how am I going to stand up? How am I going to get through life? Survival means many different things to different people. Survival, in my case, means getting up in the morning and figuring out a new life. Life is sad. It's always very sad when you lose a parent, but you have to go on. Where better to go? than a place where you're not really suffering from your name in the same way that a Maxwell would suffer back in Britain. And so she invents Ghislaine Maxwell Socialite and heads off to New York. She had this tremendous survival instinct, which clearly kicked in, and she went to New York where she set her sights on finding a daddy replacement. And that is a crucial moment in why we then see her get involved to the degree that she did with Epstein. I think we'd all have to conclude that, sadly, she sold her soul to the devil. Don't you feel insecure, scared from the future? No, I'm lucky I get to start again. I'm extremely sad that my father is no longer here. And for all the difficult times for everybody that's been involved, but I don't feel in any way smaller, lesser than what I was before. I'm me. Tonight, as the lady Ghislaine lay at birth, 
the gathering of Robert Maxwell's family was completed. Ghislaine Maxwell joined her mother and elder brother Philip aboard the yacht along with senior police officers and translators. So after Robert Maxwell's death, everyone found out about the pension funds. The Maxwell name was Dirt. For Ghislaine, that's when her world fell apart. Ghislaine Maxwell arrived on the shores of New York, devastated by her father's death. Nobody was there, nobody saw, so you'll never be sure of exactly what took place. The only thing I'm sure of is that he did not commit suicide. For Ghislaine, it's like, right, I've got to survive. So she set her sights on finding a daddy replacement. And then it turned from a fairy tale into a nightmare. Ghislaine fled to New York because of the media storm surrounding her family. It was a kind of an obvious choice for her. sort of like the next kind of city that I would be able to compare to somewhere like London, very metropolitan, and she was very in with the Americans. And I think the Americans sort of embraced that. You don't like publicity, right? You told me that you love the fact that not everybody really knows who you are in New York. It's great. I can uh, I have my friends and I can lead my life and people don't come up and say, so how are you feeling? You know? So are you okay? How are you doing? You know, it's, it's, I mean, other people's lives are very interesting too. I like to have the opportunity to ask them questions. I don't always like to be the one that people are asking the questions of. New York was the ideal place to go because it was seen as somewhere you can reinvent yourself, that actually New Yorkers don't care about your background or your scandal. If you've got money and you've got influence, that's all they care about. I remember meeting Ghislaine with mutual friends at a nightclub. I was struck immediately by her sort of amazing incandescent charm, self-deprecating humor, bright as hell. We were drinking and dancing, and I just thought, whoa, this girl is really fun. I hope I get to see her again. I've known Galen since the 90s. I mean, the 90s as a whole, it was just a debauchery. It was the lead up to Millennium and everyone was having a wild time. Galen always struck me as someone that was very, like, full of life, very confident, you know, fun, outgoing and was always like jetting around somewhere fabulous. 
she always had this kind of air of mystery about her. She never gave away too much, but she gave away enough that you kind of wanted to find out more. I met Ghislaine at a party, well-dressed, not spectacularly memorable, not overly sexy. I'm standing with my wife and Ghislaine came over and we spoke for about a second and she said, you know, if you lost 10 pounds, I'd fuck you. I think she was an opportunist and I think she did what pleased her in the moment. With Ghislaine, definitely there was a side to her where she really enjoyed telling like dirty jokes and things like that. <laughs> She would like demonstrate certain things. <laughs> God sake. She would demonstrate how to do a blowjob. <laughs> she came across as this raunchy extrovert, and you got the feeling would have done anything to please a man. She invited me over to her apartment. She was living in the East 60s in Manhattan at that point in a small um, apartment with white walls and very unadorned. She wasn't living, you know, at the Plaza Hotel. It was not a fancy environment. I got the impression at the time that the consequences of her father's death was that she had no money and that her mother was dealing with uh, financial terrible reversals. The shares, which were really the value of, of my husband's fortune, have collapsed and from uh, whatever was there, now at zero. I have myself no money at all. I subsequently learned that Ghislaine had a, um, had a trust fund. She had a meager trust fund. But for Ghislaine, someone who moved in the social circles and wanted to attend the best parties and travel around, she needed someone with real money. And Jeffrey Epstein was going to be that benefactor to her. It's been incorrectly reported that Ghislaine and Jeffrey Epstein first met when Ghislaine came to America. And that's been an error. They met in London, way before she came to America. So her father dies around November of 91, and then it's just a few weeks after he dies, she seems to be have, associating with Epstein publicly. Ghislaine set her sights on Jeffrey Epstein, who could give her the lifestyle that she'd become accustomed to. The men that she tended to be around, I mean, I don't know if they were all corrupt, um, but Epstein and her father, I mean, those would be two men that had that kind of terrible moral compass. Jeffrey wanted to get in that world of financial fraud. He viewed it as a place where he could capitalize. And that's exactly what he did. And so Epstein hooks up with a real bona fide Ponzi artist named Stephen Hoffenberg. I don't know if you've spoken to him, but he's he's an entertaining character. I was charged with 
securities violations, obstruction of justice, tax violations, mail fraud, activities of misconduct that I pled guilty to. Hoffenberg pled guilty to fraud, admitting that he cheated investors out of nearly half a billion dollars. He'll now have to pay as much restitution as he can to those taken in in his Ponzi scheme. It was one of the biggest Ponzi schemes recorded at that time in the U.S. history, yes. I suffered 18 years in federal prison without exposing the crimes of Jeffrey Epstein and in my opinion, he stole over $100 million from Towers Financial. As Jeffrey Epstein is wont to do, he avoided investigation. He avoided any sort of scrutiny for his behavior in that Ponzi scheme. But it is after that that he seems to have accumulated a substantial amount of wealth. Epstein was going from one scam to another. He was always scamming people or taking money and promoting himself. And then he was introduced to Les Wexner. U.S. retailing billionaire Leslie Wexner founded L Brands, the company behind Victoria's Secret. Wexner hired him. And that's what made Jeffrey a rich man. Epstein worked as Wexner's money manager, but they had a very strangely close relationship. And a lot of colleagues of Wexner's and uh, you know, former friends have gone on record to talk about how strange the whole thing was. Epstein's modus operandi was deception. People raised speculation about blackmail and all this type of stuff. Some people believe that Epstein stole a hundred million from Wexner. According to the L Brand CEO, Epstein misappropriated millions of dollars from him and his foundation. The point about Jeffrey is there was no tactic which he was not willing to use to get what he wanted. That would have been familiar to Ghislaine. She knew about dealing with devious and corrupt men. When you grow up with that, it becomes normal. townhouse of this guy that Glenn was seeing was the house described as the largest private house in Manhattan. So we were all very intrigued to know who this guy was. But I think the first time I met Jeffrey, I ran into them at a, an exhibition opening and Ghislaine seemed very excited that she was introducing me to the guy she was dating and he was wearing faded jeans. Everyone else was, you know, in fancy cocktail attire, but it seemed to be part of his shtick. He had this almost permanent smirk as if he was so successful and such a, such a big deal, and it was kind of a privilege for you to be meeting him. What Ghislaine would have offered him was entree to the world he wanted. This is a guy who 
often came across to some of her friends as an idiot, okay, by the things he said. They knew Jeffrey had money, but his appearance, the way he talked, um, his social graces were completely uh, below Ghislaine Maxwell. She wanted to make him over. She viewed him as something of a project. Whether she was in love with Epstein or not, she was certainly uh, very infatuated by him, drawn to him, and she wanted to be his wife. During that time when I did first meet her, they really seemed like a couple, and they seemed like very, very happy together. I remember thinking, I was always surprised, like, they never got married. She was the butterfly. She was the one bringing people in for him, almost in a way. And then I suppose he turned that into business contacts. Uh, I wrote an article for Mother Jones where I called every person in Jeffrey Epstein's little black book. I saw a screenshot of it and I noticed that it was unredacted. So I just checked some really dark, awful corners of the internet and I found it. I was like 1,500 names. There were princes, CEOs, Nobel Prize winners, celebrities. It was a really sort of good cross-section of the global elite. Donald Trump is in there. Prince Andrew, obviously. But a lot of the people I called in the book uh, had only ever met Maxwell. I mean, I think that probably uh, most of the people in the Black Book were her connections and her entree. Her father had the biggest newspaper group in England, you know, so she knew everyone. Jeffrey Epstein sort of inherits that. Without Ghislaine Maxwell, he never would have climbed to the upper echelons of um, society. It was clear that her attraction to Jeffrey was profound. Whether it was romantic, sexual, or transactional is just, you know, I cannot know. I never saw them being particularly demonstrative physically. What Ghislaine wanted was security. Obviously, if he married her, that gave her immense security. But the sense of them both, I feel, is that it was always going to be an arrangement. One person who knew them both pretty well, you know, described to me as this really toxic, almost middle school, on again, off again, codependency, jealousy sort of thing. I didn't get the picture of like this wholesome, you know, fulfilling relationship for either of them. Out of the blue, I got a call from Ghislaine. Her mother was coming to New York and she wanted to introduce her to all of her closest friends, which included me at the time. And the invitation was to go to the townhouse so it was in Jeffrey's house, but he didn't seem to be there. I remember a strange thing about this party. It was a cocktail party, so I was moving around the room and talking to friends. And I kept on hearing it from different people. People saying, it's kind of weird, you know, Ghislaine's dating this guy, Jeffrey Epstein. Apparently he's very successful. But the... The weird thing is, apparently he likes sort of younger girls. And I remember hearing at the time that Ghislaine um, is always trying to please him. And so she's introducing him to schoolgirls. I just thought it was really kind of odd.
I truly wonder what Ghislaine's first instinct was when she learned about Jeffrey's dark secret. Because what is part of history is that Ghislaine didn't run away. She didn't flee. She didn't drop him like a hot potato and go back to England. She stayed with him. I think Ghislaine stayed with Jeffrey because that had become her life. And she saw herself as this kind of all-powerful partner to this powerful man. I would say that Ghislaine fell under Jeffrey's spell and was willing to do anything for him. But he had an insatiable sexual appetite. She could not satisfy him that way, and that's why she brought in others. And the women were young. Jeffrey became really interested in young girls from the New York Academy of Art. Gillen was always there at the art shows, sort of scoping out people. She knew what Jeffrey liked, like she knew the physical type. Maria Farmer was graduating from the New York Academy of Art. She had painted pictures of her prepubescent younger sister that Jeffrey saw. So Jeffrey bought the painting the night of my graduation. I end up being introduced to Jeffrey and Guilan. And he went to shake my hand and he said, you're so talented, I love your painting. I am an artist, and I was a painter in New York for many years. Okay, so we are still rolling. Okay, so, yes, so basically, this is Guilin Maxwell, and here's Jeffrey Epstein. <sighs> After meeting them, I just remember thinking they were kind of a weird couple. Like, I thought they were strange. Um, Jeffrey was all smiley and a little bit too much, you know? Very um, gregarious, like, warm, affable guy. And she was just kind of standing there, you know, pretending to be nice. So the next interaction, I get a call from Jeffrey Epstein, and he wanted me to meet him in his office the next morning. I showed up, and um, and he's created a job for me. He moved a big white desk into the into the 71st Street Mansion, and that was my job then was to watch that door. I had a big white book, and I signed people in. I gleaned a lot about the way they behaved. It was very strange. They recorded everyone who ever came and went. Jeffrey showed me uh, the room where he had all the video cameras. And he just gave me a little tour. He was very proud of it. But they told me that they were married. And so that's why I felt comfortable with them. Because I believed they were a married couple that really were into philanthropy and education. Gilan was predominantly in charge of everything because she's the one who determined like what his appointments were. She was the one marching people upstairs. Adults, you know, people coming in. 
and then a lot of children. Always little girls, you know. And she said they were modeling for all kinds of uh, companies. And then they had all these dignitaries coming and going and presidents and yeah. There were a couple times where girls cried. And one time I remember the little girl in her skirt, like teenager braces, the whole thing crying, coming downstairs. Yulan said, Maria, she didn't get the job. Victoria's Secret, it's a tough business. Modeling is a tough business. She was very, very cold. She was very glamorous and cold and vicious. Ghislaine was very moody and terribly materialistic. She loved shopping and she loved exercising. She would go rollerblading for hours. And then she would get that high and come back and be in a really good mood. And then like that, she would turn. Every day at 3.30, she would shift. She was just screaming orders at me and screaming orders at the chef or the maids. And she would run out the door. At the time, I was like, what is going on with this person? She would go out and find the new bios that she said were models that were really girls that she was procuring for Jeffrey. And she would go do this by going after school to Central Park. I did ride with her and saw how she did this in the limousine. And saw her spotting a girl in a uniform. And I saw her pop out, jump out of the car and go get that girl's phone number. You know, this was before cell phones. It was terrifying. Can you imagine being the parents and your kids are walking home and they're, oh my God. I quit many times because of Ghislaine. And Jeffrey would always talk me back into staying. One time he said, I've talked to Abigail Wexner and she said she would be delighted to have you. She wants an artist in residence on the property. You can have all the room in the world to do your paintings. So I thought, what an amazing opportunity. These people, you know, they're patrons of the arts. They have Picassos. This is great. This is going to be a wonderful experience. And it was not a wonderful. It, was, it ruined my life. It was the very experience it was, that ruined my life. You go to this the state in Ohio in this old writer truck with all my art supplies. So when I was on the Wexner estate, Keelan and Jeffrey came on three occasions to visit over the summer. And one time I was in the room, I was reading. It was late in the evening. In comes Ghislaine Maxwell. And she was on a robe. And I thought that was weird because I'd never seen her in a robe. And it made me very nervous. It made me feel my stomach hurt because why is she being intimate like this? She comes to get me to take me into Jeffrey's room. And I remember I'd never been in that room. They always said it was off limits. And so I'm in there and Jeffrey's watching a PBS show on math. And he goes, rub my foot. And, and, and she's like, rub Jeffrey's foot right now. His feet are hurting. And he goes here and he pats the bed and he wanted me to sit down beside him. Ghislaine looks at me and she sits next to me on the bed and she lies down. They um, began assaulting me together, and uh, I really blocked out a lot of it. 
I don't remember it. I just remember, you know, not being very comfortable. And I remember um, looking at the ceiling. And so really at that point, it doesn't matter physically what's happening to me. I'm not saying it doesn't count, but compared to everything else, it didn't matter to me. I started crying. It felt very mechanical and very bizarre what was happening to me. And, um, and from that point on, I, never, I have not been the same person. After I was assaulted on the Wexner estate, I didn't know what to do, but I thought, well, I'll just go back to New York. I went to the police first. The chief of police told me to call the FBI and he gave me the phone number. I called and I spoke for about 45 minutes to this man and he seemed very unfazed by everything I said. And I said a lot of big, heavy things. I asked the FBI to do their job and they never did it. I gave them everything and I gave it to them in 1996, it makes me crazy. After I returned to New York, Elon Maxwell was calling and harassing me through others as well. Through Elan, someone called and threatened me and said that I should have never spoken to the FBI and I had never told anyone. So that scared me. And then one day, Ghislaine called me, screaming at me. She threatened my family's safety. She threatened to burn our house down. She threatened to burn my career. I mean, there were numerous threats made against my life. Until I experienced the assault, I had this great amount of respect for Jeffrey. Um, and I had no idea that he was harming people, so it was, he had a long way to fall because I'd put him up on this pedestal. But I wouldn't have put anything past Keyland because at that point, I saw what she was. She's a monster. Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell were cast in this horrific sense from this same mold. And the two of them were living between these two worlds of New York and Palm Beach, between high society and this very dark world of Jeffrey's web. We now know Epstein utilized his jet to travel back and forth and started to use the same techniques he was using in New York down here in South Florida. And Glenn Maxwell was essentially working as a house madam for Epstein in Palm Beach. First time I went to Florida with Jeffrey and Gilan, I was working for them, and Gilan typically would get up and exercise, like go swimming. And then she would shop. And then she would make appointments for Jeffrey, you know, for massages.
Well, I don't know how she spent her days in Palm Beach, but I suspect she was probably just a very well-paid personal assistant. You know, but did what he needed to have done and fielded his phone calls. And I think that she was just sort of a paid wife. They're here for the same reason I think everybody else was. It's Palm Beach, and it's the place where you, you want to be, especially when there's such horrible, awful winters in New York. And also, there's a lot of prestige. It was always seen that Palm Beach was where the wealthy lived. And West Palm Beach was where the servants lived. At 7 o'clock in the morning, you can't get across that bridge. It's the landscapers and the household staff and the bankers and the stockbrokers that are all coming to work. And at 3.30, off they go, and then Palm Beachers have their playpen back to themselves again. So they go to parties or they go out to dinner. Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell really kind of worked together as a team to establish this image in Palm Beach. Ghislaine and Jeffrey were, were out and about, uh, mostly in Mar-a-Lago, all the time. Maxwell would attend parties and events with Jeffrey Epstein, where she would approach young girls in the bathroom who were attendants there working at Mar-a-Lago. I'm working at Mar-a-Lago in the spa area, and that's when Ghislaine came up to me. She said, I've got a person that I know who's actually looking for a traveling masseuse. If he likes you, we can get you educated. You'll be a real masseuse. And you'll get to travel and see the world. And uh, if you want, I can get you an interview with him. What you hear is a consistent story. And that is essentially that Galen seems to be a hunter. She was out seeking victims for Epstein to bring back that game to him so that he could feed off of his depraved nature and desires. One of the girls said she's laying much of the mall out there, the Wellington Mall. Or she went to the Royal Palm Beach Middle School or Royal Palm Beach High School. She couldn't prey on girls from the right side of the tracks because the girls at the right side of the tracks in Palm Beach, they had nannies. They had, you know, stay-at-home mothers. They had chaperones. It's one of those life moments that I'll never forget. You know, like, she made it sound like it was a dream come true. And it wasn't. Lynn walks me up the stairs. There's this naked guy laying on a massage table in the middle of the room. I thought, okay, well, this is just how they do it, I suppose. We did the back of him, and then when he turned over, um, that's when I was instructed to... Um, to... That's when I was instructed to um, get undressed and um, and have sex with Jeffrey Epstein. Gillen Maxwell was participating as well. Unfortunately, Galen would engage and participate in some of the depraved events that Jeffrey Epstein would be engaged in here in Palm Beach. 
and she would train other young women to be able to recruit young girls and bring them to the home. I brought Jeffrey anywhere from 50 to 70 girls. Just to know that I had any influence on that happening to somebody else just breaks my heart. He needed to have girls on constant call. In every single state or every place that he goes to, he's already got people lined up and makers making that happen. I was a baby stuck in a world where grown-ups were allowed to do whatever they wanted. As an adult, I know it's right to run, but as a kid, the last thought that I had was, well, this is what life's about. I just felt like I had to. I didn't have an option. Like, what was I going to do? I was the only one in the room with him. Like, where was I going to go? If I screamed, who was going to hear me? Who was going to come? Elaine controlled the girls. She was like the madam. She was like the nuts and bolts of the sex trafficking operation. She'd always make sure that the girls were doing what they were supposed to be doing. So this was very much a joint effort. It's my personal opinion that Ghislaine Maxwell is worse than Jeffrey Epstein. Here's a girl from a really large family, a really close family, um, supposedly. She has nieces of that age. What happened is she has so dissociated herself from the lives of these girls that they were nothing to her. They were not useful. They're not seen as real people because her whole thing is about who can help me, who can be useful to me. I find that abhorrent. Living in that world of wealth and influence, you lose complete perspective on the rest of society and, frankly, the rest of the world. And you just think that you are untouchable. And that's the way that Ghislaine Maxwell operated, and that's the way that Jeffrey Epstein operated. And until it all came crashing down around them, they appeared that they were going to get away with it. antics went on for so long because they lived under the radar. The reason why I wanted to talk to you is I am conducting an ongoing investigation on a subject by the name of Jeffrey Epstein. The investigation began in 2005 with a tip from a girl's parents who were worried because they had found, I think, $300 in their daughter's pocket after visiting a mansion over in Palm Beach proper. If it had not been for the mother of the girl who complained about where did my daughter get this $300 from a rich man in Palm Beach, I, he would probably still be doing it. Hello? Hi, this is Detective Jerry Carey with Palm Beach Police. Hi. How are you? Well, they had interviews with lots of young women, and they were all on the record of having sex with him when they were underage. He had a towel over his private parts, and he was just laying on a table. During the time that you're massaging him on his chest, is he touching himself? Yeah. And each time you went, did he offer you more monies to do more things? Yes. Apparently, the detective learned that 
There were recording devices in the house. There were cameras. And so one of the things that you almost always do is you do a search warrant. What they noticed immediately when they went in and did the search warrant, they noticed that the computers, the hard drives were missing. They noticed that with respect to the cameras, there was no recordings of what the cameras had shown. So they figured out quite quickly that Epstein had been tipped off. But what they were able to find in the search were written records. There were records of sort of who they were paying. One of the girls, they found a, um, a certificate from her high school um, with her name on it. They find all kinds of things. They find message books, photographs still on the wall of naked women. So they found various pieces of documentary evidence that confirmed a couple of things. One, that they were paying girls, and two, that the girls were underage. So they believed that that combined with the interviews that they had done with the girls, that they had a, a, a fairly strong case and that they had a serial pedophile on their hands. Reclusive billionaire Jeffrey Epstein, once labeled one of New York's most eligible bachelors, was investigated by the Palm Beach police for months. The police conclusion, Epstein's Palm Beach mansion was a revolving door for women, and in some cases, girls as young as 16. That according to a voluminous probable cause affidavit. They gather all this evidence together and essentially present it to the state's attorney. And ultimately, the state attorney's office were going to allow Jeffrey Epstein to plead guilty to a misdemeanor of soliciting minors for prostitution. Do you have any questions I'd like you to call me to answer? Absolutely. Absolutely. I have yourself. Okay. And I'll call you direct. Well, these girls were about as far removed from prostitution as you can get. So the Palm Beach police were very upset with the charging decisions that the state attorneys were making. So they went over to the FBI and they said, look, we have an individual here who's a serial child molester, if you will, um, of young girls. The FBI comes in at that point. And then they begin investigating not only Jeffrey Epstein, but Miss Maxwell in regards to her part in this entire process. The FBI begins to see this web of other people that are involved in this conspiracy to abuse young girls. One of those people at the top of this pyramid is Ghislaine Maxwell. So the FBI in Miami took it to Alexander Acosta, who was the U.S. attorney in Miami. The feds didn't prosecute him. That's no deal. The, 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 it's, the feds did nothing. They did nothing. Would you raise your right hand, please? Yes. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guide? Yes, I do. So the federal non-prosecution agreement basically said, Epstein, you bad boy. By the way, if you plead guilty to those state charges, we'll go away. Could you please give us your name? Jeffrey Epstein. But the worst part about the FBI is they never told us that they settled with him. We did not know he was given a deal. I can't, I can't even believe that happened. I mean, it's just shocking.
So he did plead guilty to state charges of recruiting minors for prostitution. Jeffrey Epstein went to jail just before 10 this morning. He pleaded guilty in open court. The guilty plea and deal end a years-long process that could have sent Epstein to jail for 15 years. Epstein is given 15 months in jail. The deal they made was the dumbest deal in history. Not only is a sweetheart deal, he got rewarded. How did he get rewarded? He got immunity for named and unnamed people. Well, how the heck does that happen? Glenn Maxwell was definitely a part of the original investigation by the FBI. So we know that she was intimately involved in the thoughts and processes of how this ultimate sweetheart deal was negotiated to provide immunity to unnamed co-conspirators like Glenn. So my first question as a prosecutor is, oh, tell me what she did. Jeffrey Epstein's arrested, he's charged, he gets this sweetheart deal. We printed it and people were outraged. And, but it was, a, it was a done deal, literally. Alex Acosta was the federal prosecutor who approved that deal for Jeffrey Epstein. Alexander Acosta accepted a deal called a non-prosecution agreement. The deal also protected Epstein's accomplices from prosecution. Maxwell and all the others who came on board walk. Epstein is allowed out of prison every day from sunrise to midnight. He has his own suite in the prison. This was horrific, absolutely horrific. Between 10 a.m. and 10 p.m., Fridays through Wednesdays, Jeffrey Epstein is allowed to leave his temporary home here at the Palm Beach County Stockade. Instead, PBSO says Epstein comes here to the West Palm Beach office of his Florida Science Foundation. Work release privilege was granted despite explicit sheriff's department rules stating that sex offenders don't qualify at all for work release. For a victim to be kept in the dark entirely, in conjunction with an FBI probe being shut down and a favorable plea, according to reporting, that says he's able to have work release privileges and be able to leave his jail cell. That's what's so shocking about this. The Federal Bureau of Investigation knew that Epstein and Guillen had this operation and they did nothing. The FBI didn't want to know what Jillian Maxwell knew. They didn't want to know what his butler knew or what the uh, pilots on his private plane knew. In fact, it was just the opposite. This was a case where they tried to get people to shut up. This was a cover-up. Look. Bill Clinton's name has been attached to Jeffrey Epstein. Donald Trump's name's been attached to... I mean, it is a who's who of people have been... And it, it just smells as if some large hand said, we don't want this. Well, Keep and, this and rock. Also, it's a who's who of defense lawyers on the other side. They had a 53-count indictment against him. All of a sudden, it disappears? Why? Why would that happen? How could that happen? The first time I heard about the surveillance videos and tapes was from an extremely close friend of Ghislaine.
I saw where the cameras were at the 71st Street house because he showed me the room. And so I looked on those cameras and I saw that they were all very private scenes. And it was, they were taping like the bathroom and the beds. According to Ghislaine, there were secret surveillance tapes. The powerful people he had captured having sex in his bedrooms, presumably with underage girls. And that was his weapon. Jeffrey and Ghislaine may have been sitting on videotapes. This was incriminating evidence against some of the rich and powerful individuals that they did business with. I believe Jeffrey and Ghislaine were working together. Ghislaine was getting children, and then they were being put into horrible situations with these dignitaries and these men. Just in my opinion from observing, there was a definite blackmail operation going on. Once Jeffrey Epstein moved to Palm Beach, Ghislaine Maxwell was essentially working for him. I would say Ghislaine was under Jeffrey's spell and was willing to do anything for him. Hello? Detective Jerry Carey with Palm Beach Police. Palm Beach Police, when they did the search warrant, found evidence that they had a serial pedophile on their hands. But the feds did nothing. They did nothing. Could you please give us your name? Jeffrey Epstein. He's arrested, he's charged, but he gets this sweetheart deal. A guilty plea and deal ending process that could have sent Epstein to jail for 15 years. And he got 18 months because they, pardon my French, didn't give a shit about the victims. The deal they made was the dumbest deal in history. He's able to have work release privileges and leave his jail cell. He negotiated also essentially immunity for Ghislaine Maxwell. Why? Why would that happen? I believe it was a blackmail operation. I mean, what else would it be? These people get away with everything. The FBI didn't want to know what Jillian Maxwell knew. This was a cover-up. The state's happy they have a conviction. Epstein got this sweetheart deal. Everybody's happy. They believed this thing was going to go away. That's, I think, what Epstein and Maxwell were counting on. sex offender Jeffrey Epstein made a sneaky getaway from jail this morning. Typically, when released, the former inmates are able to walk free across this bridge to a parking lot below, but not Epstein. He was able to exit from an area below, an area where a vehicle was waiting for him. We're told for his security and privacy. Jeffrey's just happy that this is over and he's ready to move on to the next portion of his life. Jeffrey and Ghislaine moved back to New York after he got out of Palm Beach County. In Florida, he had to register as a sex offender. But they re-entered social circles in New York as if, as if nothing had happened. After he was convicted and it was in the press, he was not shunned by a certain set of people in New York. These are people who are sophisticated in the media, who live on the news. How could they not have known? 
In my opinion, because of everything I've seen, wealthy people always get away with everything. And money makes up for all, all, all wrongs in New York society. If one of my best friends went to jail, I wouldn't just cut them off like right away. I would want to like find out what happened. And you know, a lot of these things, you can't really believe media and all of this. Like it's, it's hard to know who to believe. But during that time, I would see her solo. She wouldn't really mention him and what happened. New Yorkers don't care about your background or your scandal. If you've got money and you've got influence, that's all they care about. It's who you are in this minute now. Epstein and Ghislaine both engaged in reputational laundering. And what they do is they tried to recast themselves as um, philanthropists. Tell everybody how much you love the ocean, love your planet for generations to come. So how does it, does it all look? Is my hair good? Do I, it's all good. <laughs> she was really ramping up her presence across the country in terms of attending social events. She was very engaging and charming. She had this incredible vocabulary and she could speak many languages. So she could just jump in at a party and start talking to anyone. And she really began focusing on cultivating the Clintons. I was at a dinner and Bill Clinton was there. A lot of other influential names, you know, she was very pally with Bill Clinton. Glenn and Bill just looked like very at ease with each other. They were all in the same orbit and Ghislaine is in her element. This is exactly what she's used to. Private jets and presidents. They go back a long way. You know, she went to Chelsea Clinton's wedding. There was still money coming in from Jeffrey, but at the same time, Ghislaine was trying to legitimize herself. She was trying to move herself away from the Jeffrey Epstein world. And this was going to be her way out. Today we have Ghislaine. And Ghislaine, tell me about your new project. So uh, the Terramar project is a new ocean initiative. It was then that Ghislaine began this Terramar nonprofit. It's an ocean-based uh, digital platform to uh, which I'm going to be talking to you about. Uh, and so the job of the Terramar project is to create an, a global ocean community. I created a pledge, and the pledge is that you love the ocean, and it's called the I Love the Ocean Pledge. It's relatively easy to sign. You go in, you say, I love the ocean. I will spread my love of the ocean with my family and friends. And when you say, yes, you love the ocean, you receive a digital passport. You then get a passport that makes you a joint citizen of land and sea, and you become, uh, you get a Terramar passport. So we not only will have our own citizenship and passport for our yes. country, yes. but we will actually have our own flag and a passport yes. for the ocean. Yes, and you also have a daily newspaper. It's called the Daily Catch. Terma also has um, is a global is a uh, online platform uh, to uh, give information to everybody, and this way you have all the. Uh, Terramar is was mostly a website. If you were to look at the website, you have the option to buy up parts of the ocean through her. Obviously, I'm not selling the ocean. It's only a digital representation. But you get to buy a piece of the ocean on here. You get to tell She would bring in interns, and, and they would accompany Ghislaine to go and speak at schools and universities and in front of the UN. Um, a sustainable development goal at the UN is, I think, a fantastic thing. The United Nations is absolutely the right place to lead this. Thank you. When Glenn invited me over to her house, the thing she most wanted to talk about and that she was very eloquent about was, was saving the world's oceans. And I'd never heard her talk about that stuff ever before. And I figured, I guess she moved on from Epstein. He's not part of her life anymore. Who, it, who loves the ocean in this room? Can you please raise your hands if you do? When I would see her, she would be talking about Terramar. I think 
being involved with a, a charity was definitely a way to like detract from like the negative press that was surrounding Jeffrey and rebranding herself. Caramark gave Ghislaine the vehicle to appear on this international stage, which is what she was cultivating at the time. She was being seen with just about everybody. She was being photographed uh, with everybody. And she was looking into romances with other individuals. Ghislaine was in Reykjavik at the Arctic Circle Assembly. It was a conference where invited members were there to meet, mingle, and to present their findings on various topics. And that's where she met Scott Borgerson. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to this afternoon's meeting. Scott Borgerson is a tech entrepreneur. He founded a company called Cargo Metrics. We've been building a patented system to bring big data to shipping. When I first met Scott, he struck me as one of those startup people. You know, they're very eager. They're always selling you. The Terramar operation put her in contact with a whole new crowd of people, including Scott Borgerson. Arctic nations are actually working in a concerted way. Borgerson was very connected to the Trump administration, who had been in the Coast Guard and started his own global logistics company. I do think that both of them were opportunists. I can't imagine a better union, really. They can help each other. He was married at that point, but eventually she hooked up with him. Everything is going along just great. She's got this little ocean-saving philanthropy. She's giving a TED Talk. She's succeeding until Virginia Giffray drops a bomb into it. You know, the next day, Ghislaine tells me I did a really good job. You know, she pats me on the back and said, you made him really happy. Virginia Roberts alleges that she was kept as a sex slave for three years by Jeffrey Epstein. Ms. Roberts opted to go public, giving an interview to a British tabloid. In 2015, Virginia Roberts Jeffrey decided to sell her story to the Daily Mail. The Daily Mail publishes this expose that said, for the first time that Virginia was trafficked to other men besides Jeffrey, including Prince Andrew. British newspapers have published this picture of Roberts with the Prince when she was just 17. The Daily Mail has got 10 questions here that it believes the palace should be answering. And the first one is, how did this picture come to be taken? Gillen tells me that I have to do for Andrew what I do for Jeffrey. And that made me sick. I just didn't expect it from someone that people look up to and admire, you know, in the royal family. Virginia Roberts filed legal papers in Florida, claiming that she was forced to have sex with Prince Andrew on several occasions. Here it's also mentioning somebody I haven't heard about for years, daughter of um, Robert Maxwell. I think it's um, Ghislaine Maxwell. At that point, Ghislaine Maxwell, for the first time, enters the public domain as a participant in this Jeffrey Epstein sex trafficking operation. When the story started coming out, I, I was really shocked. And people that have known her like since university, they're like, wow. We never saw that side in her. I still find some of it hard to believe. This person in the newspaper is actually someone that we knew or thought we knew. Ask you about the, the, all the allegations that have come out, Ghislaine. Obviously, they're very damning. 
involving British royalty. Glenn was no longer associated with Epstein in a public way. But we know they were in contact when the Daily Mail article came out, when he emails her and says, you've done nothing wrong. Go forward with your head high. So she gets her public relations team, writes a press release denying all and calling Virginia a liar. Have you spoken to Happy Prince New Andrew? Year. Happy New Year. Have you spoken to Prince Andrew? I made a statement. Thank you. Virginia then gets herself lawyered up, and they bring a defamation suit against Ghislaine Maxwell. During the deposition, she is slamming her hand on the table. She's knocking things over. She doesn't want to have anything to do with this. She views all of this as an, you know, as an inconvenience. I think it's nonsense that in the deposition, she's acting as if she's such a rather prim, prudish woman who really wouldn't go to such uh, depravity. It seems completely fantastical to me. I think it's a complete um, fabrication of who she really is. Virginia Jeffrey's defamation case against Ghislaine Maxwell was settled in June 2017. And at that point, she sells this $15 million townhouse that Jeffrey had bought her. And she starts to retreat from New York society. Virginia's expose definitely would have rattled her. I think that would have rattled like anybody that gets exposed like that. Her last really big appearance was out in Europe doing this cash and rocket charity car drive to raise money for poor women while flaunting, you know, high-end luxury goods. Days have been long, but very, very fun. All the girls... She was photographed with other socialites, and that was the last time you really saw her in public. Reporters at the Miami Herald have dug into a long dormant story and what they found about Jeffrey Epstein could blow the whole sordid tale wide open once again. Nothing else would have happened to Epstein except for a reporter at the Miami Herald named Julie K. Brown did an in-depth investigation about the Epstein case and the sweetheart deal. It was alleged that he had molested all these girls, you know, dozens if not hundreds of girls. And I thought, where are these girls now? And what do they think about this deal? And I started from that vantage point. The Miami Herald collected dozens of corroborating witnesses stating the same things that Virginia was alleging. The feds were embarrassed by the Miami Herald story and forced to take some action. Jeffrey Epstein was arrested in a covert operation as he landed on a flight from France. Authorities seen here raiding his home in Manhattan. Agents hauling out boxes of the financier's belongings. Today, we announce the unsealing of sex trafficking charges against Jeffrey Epstein. They basically just dusted off the same indictment that was prepared in 2007 in Florida and was shelved after Acosta made this deal. While the charge conduct is from a number of years ago, it is still profoundly important to the many alleged victims. So they basically just took the old indictment and filed it in Manhattan. Jeffrey Epstein will be in court tomorrow to face new charges of sex crimes involving underage girls. Shortly after Jeffrey's arrest, I became completely transfixed by the story. This was a guy I'd known, not very well, but I had known Ghislaine and been very, very fond of her. But this is another dimension of Ghislaine that I was totally unaware of and was deeply sickened and horrified by. 
All of his homes had video equipment, and the FBI reportedly found troves of pictures of underage girls. So the federal government has in its possession a large amount of video and photographic evidence that would be devastating to Epstein's co-conspirators. And it seemed that inevitably, at some point, Ghislaine was going to be implicated. Why do you think he's received the treatment he has in the justice system? Well, that's a question I still want to know. Hopefully the judge will do the right thing here and make sure that he doesn't get out. After Jeffrey Epstein's arrest in 2019, everyone wondered whether he was going to go to trial or not. His attorneys are arguing that this feels like double jeopardy because years ago, Epstein struck a deal with federal prosecutors in Florida over similar crimes, granting him immunity after he pleaded guilty to a lesser charge. But prosecutors are now saying that was only for Florida, not for New York. I went to a party in Saint-Tropez of a famous British property developer, and suddenly I saw Ghislaine uh, and went up to her and introduced myself. She seemed, in many ways, not only unemotional, but also detached from life altogether. She seemed lost. Terramar was closed down right after Jeffrey Epstein's arrest in 2019. And people started to wonder whether Ghislaine Maxwell was going to be apprehended and put on trial herself. But then there's this bombshell Breaking news out of New York, convicted pedophile and accused sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein is dead. Epstein had been on suicide watch, but was taken off shortly before his death. The U.S. Attorney's Office was getting ready to prosecute this guy, and all of a sudden he ends up dead in their custody. The government alleges he committed suicide by hanging himself with bedsheets that he had tied into knots. He had told people that he was suicidal. He was left alone in his cell with his sheets, and he was given the opportunity to commit suicide. The suicide theory is the one that the government has gone with, but immediately after he was found dead, the media began questioning the circumstances. The conspiracy theories are flying because the whole story doesn't make any sense. If he has all these secrets on people, you could see, okay, there's a motivation for some wealthy person to hire a hitman to go in and somehow murder him in prison. I do believe he was killed by people that didn't want to be exposed. I think there's a huge amount of conspiracy about how Epstein died and whether it was suicide or whether it was foul play, just as there has been about Robert Maxwell for many, many years. In the Atlantic Ocean, a death and a mystery. Robert Maxwell disappeared from his yacht. There are many parallels between Robert Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein. Did Maxwell jump off the back of the boat in the Canary Islands, or was he murdered? Did Epstein hang himself in a New York prison, or was he murdered? It's actually quite creepy, the similarities between them both. And there's something very sinister about both stories. If you're Ghislaine Maxwell, and all of a sudden Jeffrey Epstein dies, that would put the fear of God into you. Some people might think that she was in fear of her life now, that maybe she believes Epstein was murdered. She felt, I think, that her Teflon Don essentially would get away again, that he would sneak away and he would somehow cut a deal and not have any concerns. My only conclusion was that, wow, she has to be afraid because she's like the next in line of succession. It's all sort of shifted to her. Maxwell had to disappear after Epstein died, not just because Epstein died, but because the Virginia Jeffrey defamation case documents had been released, and now it was public, and that's when this whole scheme started to come unraveled. It's talking about unbelievably sorted and large-scale sex trafficking. 
and her name was now associated with it. It also put front and center Prince Andrew again. Virginia Roberts says she met you in 2001 and she went on to have sex with you in a house in Belgravia belonging to Ghislaine Maxwell. Didn't happen. She was very specific about that night. Mm -hmm. She described dancing with you no. and you profusely sweating <laughs> and that she went on to have bath, there's a, there's possibly... A, there's a slight problem with, 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 with the sweating um, because uh, I... I, I have a peculiar medical condition, which is that I don't sweat, um, or I didn't sweat at the time, and that was... Oh, was she? Yes. I didn't sweat at the time because I... Um, had, he gives this atrocious well. interview where he falls on his face and embarrasses himself, embarrasses the crown. Are you saying you don't believe her? She's lying. That's a very difficult thing to um, answer because the BBC interview, yeah, that was, that was a real mistake. Do you regret the whole friendship with Epstein? <laughs> um, uh, now, uh, still not. The entire country watched it literally with our jaws on the floor. Do I regret the fact that, that, that he has quite obviously conducted himself in a manner unbecoming? Yes. Unbecoming? He was a sex offender? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm being polite, and in the sense that he was a sex offender. I think it would have probably been wiser to have just not said anything. But I, I, I... Yeah. But remember that it was his girlfriend that was the key element in this. It just so happened that Ghislaine was very good friends with Prince Andrew. But as far as Virginia, I have no idea what happened. The world has now seen the photo that yep. Virginia Roberts provided, taken by Epstein, we understand, in Ghislaine Maxwell's house. I don't remember uh, that photograph ever being taken. Your arm was around her waist. Yes. You've seen the photo. I've seen the photograph. How do you explain that? I can't. The, the, the photograph is taken upstairs, and I don't think I ever went upstairs. We you were sure of that? Yeah, because the, because, the, because the dining room and everything was on, the, was, on the, was on the ground floor. Prince Andrew's fall from grace is the most seismic thing to rock the House of Windsor in the last century, I would say. And it was Ghislaine who introduced Prince Andrew to Epstein. His girlfriend, Ghislaine Maxwell, your old friend, yep. was, victims say, complicit in his behaviour. Um, if there are questions that Ghislaine has to answer, that's her um, problem, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm, I'm not in a position to be able to comment one way or the other. Her relationship with Prince Andrew has always fascinated and intrigued me. If she has concrete proof of Prince Andrew's sexual activity with underage girls, it could spark a devastating litigation for Prince Andrew. Prince Andrew should be panicking. The rich and the mighty can fall too. There's no question in my mind that powerful people, such as Prince Andrew, are nervous about what evidence Ghislaine Maxwell could potentially produce. More so than anybody else, certainly Prince Andrew is an individual that Ghislaine has his number. The mystery is growing on the whereabouts of the British socialite who allegedly helped Epstein recruit young girls. Where in the world is Ghislaine Maxwell? She has tremendous resources and access all over the world. Once Jeffrey was dead, Ghislaine Maxwell disappears. She disappears off all radar. Reporters all over the country try to find her. That added to a little bit of her mystique. Where is Ghislaine Maxwell? Nobody knows where Maxwell is. When I was asked would they ever find her, I joked, I was like, she's probably in a submarine somewhere. The world's media hmm? has not found this woman yet. Hmm? This woman's just disappeared off the face of the earth and she's key to all of this. If you're Ghislaine Maxwell, I think her reaction was a logical one. 
oh my God, he's dead. I have to protect myself. You know, evidence hasn't really emerged of like what exactly did the NYPD pick up when they raided his house? Was there blackmail tapes there? If it's bona fide stuff, it's possible fortunes would be lost. It would be really disastrous. I think Jeffrey Epstein was a sexual deviant going after young girls. And if, if a couple of powerful men got caught up in the snare, well, jackpot. When he walked into the New York mansion to Palm Beach, everything was being filmed. Government officials, the politicians, the royalty, like, the, you know, they were taping everybody. Do you think people knew they were being taped? No. No. I do not. Not at all. Maybe Jelaine Maxwell knows where all those photographs and tapes and videos are. So the $64,000 question here is where are the tapes? If they contain what we think they do, to say that they would be explosive would be the understatement of the day. The dominant Epstein conspiracy theory is that he was videotaping all these high profile people as blackmail. And the other side of that theory is maybe he was doing this on behalf of the CIA or intelligence agencies and got recruited to spy for them. That's sort of the theory that ties it all together in terms of the videotaping and mysterious sort of high profile connections in terms of his ridiculous treatment by law enforcement in Palm Beach. And it does a pretty neat and tidy job. Those videos could be used as blackmail is compromising material on foreign dignitaries, on people in power. I have no doubt someone would have been interested in that kind of information. I obviously have no idea what transpired with Epstein's video surveillance cameras. But on Maxwell's side, there's her father, Robert Maxwell. He was for sure involved with intelligence, probably both KGB and Mossad. The Mossad the Israeli intelligence agency. Bill Heath asked the prime minister to order an immediate inquiry into the alleged relationship between the Israeli intelligence service and Robert Maxwell. The allegations about Maxwell's close connections with Israel were first made in a book by Seymour Hersh. The man had an awful lot of information about an awful lot of things and did an awful lot that we don't know very much about. One of the main sources of that book Ari ben Manashi, a former Israeli intelligence officer, claimed that Maxwell had played a major role in smuggling arms for Israel. Robert Maxwell was working for Israeli intelligence. He was an operative for, for a, quite a, a long time. He was a senior operative, as a matter of fact. I was working with him. I was sort of supervising what he was doing for us. One of the things that I learned early on at the CIA, and this is certainly consistent in other intelligence uh, organizations, is that they're often multi-generational. You want people in the same family because they know that you're loyal. And let's just say for the sake of argument that this was the Israelis that were involved. And Ghislaine Maxwell's father already had a relationship with the Israeli services. Ghislaine was important and well-connected and working at a higher level of society than most anybody else. So I don't think it's at all a leap in logic to think she's continuing to do daddy's work. Epstein started working with Israeli intelligence as well. Selling or giving or collecting secrets, however you want to put it, yes. That's right. They were... Uh, collecting secrets for the Israelis. It would be impossible for me to know the details of any sort of like government conspiracy, but there's enough there that I don't think this, I think something's going on. This is such a bigger animal than anyone knows, and Galen Maxwell has the answers, and until she talks, we may never know. We've been discreetly keeping tabs on Maxwell's whereabouts as we work this investigation. 
and more recently we learned she had slithered away to a gorgeous property in New Hampshire, continuing to live a life of privilege while her victims live with the trauma inflicted upon them years ago. On July 2nd, 2020, Galan's days of hiding are about to end. The FBI took Maxwell into custody at this home in New Hampshire. Maxwell had been carefully attempting to avoid detection using a fake name for mail and deliveries. Galen Maxwell bought a house in Bradford, New Hampshire, where the feds make a dramatic arrest. FBI agents broke through her door as she tried to, quote, flee to another room. Inside the home, agents say they found a cell phone wrapped in tinfoil on top of a desk, a seemingly misguided effort to evade detection. In the case of Ghislaine Maxwell's arrest, I don't think that 25 officers going in uh, was over the top. This was an individual that needed to be treated that way. When you capture someone like Glenn Maxwell, I don't besmirch the U.S. government from taking a victory lap. To be able to come back one year later and say, we've got the co-conspirator, they wanted a little good press, as well they should. Take her down and embarrass the hell out of her. It's what she deserves. It later turned out that she was living there with Scott Borgerson. I never knew that Scott had any relationship with Glenn Maxwell. And I was like, wait, what? Today, after many years, Ghislaine Maxwell finally stands charged for her role in these crimes. This afternoon, a federal magistrate in New Hampshire ordered Maxwell into the custody of the U.S. Marshal Service to be taken to New York. Maxwell is charged with six federal counts of sex trafficking, conspiracy to sex trafficking, and perjury. Usually you hear about this kind of sex trafficking involving men, but according to the girl's allegations, she played the role of solicitor and groomer. By charging her with multiple different counts, it gives the U.S. Attorney's Office the ability to put all of the evidence out there and let the jury pick and choose from which they wanted to convict her of. Ghislaine Maxwell today pleaded not guilty to sex trafficking charges. Wealthy and powerful people feel that they are immune to prosecution, and part of the thrill is the excitement of getting away with stuff that other people just simply cannot because you're just sort of convinced of how fantastically bright and connected and powerful you are. But that dazzling charm and wit that captivated me and so many people is unlikely to be of much use to her in a federal prison. Maxwell's jail has been described as a hellhole by some. How would you describe it? It is a tough place. MDC Brooklyn is a notoriously terrible prison, and it's a holding facility. It's a very, very difficult life in there. It's a place that has repeatedly come up in the courts because of the cruel treatment that takes place there. Maybe Ghislaine's in prison, but we haven't seen any proof of that. Forgive me, after this giant conspiracy theory I've lived, that I don't believe anything. So. Mm, I want proof. I'd like to see her. At the bail hearing on July 14th, 2020, Marcus Cohen, one of Maxwell's attorneys, told the court at one point, she's not the monster that's been portrayed by the media and the government. Quote, Ghislaine Maxwell is not Jeffrey Epstein. Her lawyers asked the judge to release Maxwell into home confinement on a $5 million bond. Then in December 2020, Scott Borgerson offers to pay $28.5 million in bail to get Glenn Maxwell out of jail in time for Christmas. Regardless of any amount of bail, whether it is $30 million, $10 million, $100 million, if the person is appearing to pay their way to get out of jail so that they can flee and avoid prosecution, the judge denies that type of bail. The risks are simply too great. The words of the judge refusing bail this evening to Ghislaine Maxwell. She'll spend the next year in jail. 
because she is viewed as a suicide risk, the lights are kept on 24 hours a day. The game plan on Ghislaine Maxwell for the government is keeping her alive. That's why she is under 24-7 watch. They can't have another Jeffrey Epstein. They can't have another person hanging from a noose in a jail cell. Now, what is her game? Her game is somehow seeing light, somehow getting through this. If she ultimately cracks under the pressure and decides that she's going to give up information, there are going to be a lot of people around the globe in very powerful positions that are going to be very concerned about what she knows and what she's going to say. Of course she's in danger. Look what happened to Jeffrey. I think she's obviously a huge target because she knows way too much on a lot of government heads of state. If in fact there were forces behind Epstein's death, she has got to be concerned that the same fate may befall her at the end of the day. Suspected child sex offender Glenn Maxwell is withering as she sits in jail awaiting trial. Her lawyer made that statement as part of a new bid to relax the conditions of Maxwell's detention. Her lawyer says Maxwell is suffering emotional abuse. Glenn Maxwell's trial is set for 2021. She's lost 20 pounds. She's losing her hair. She can't concentrate. She has a flashlight shone in her cell every 15 minutes during the night. So she has no uh, sleep. Uh, of any uh, real quality, and uh, that is torture. Why is Gillian Maxwell being treated differently? She's a patsy for Epstein, is the answer, whom they lost on their watch, and they're taking it out on my sister. Friends of mine who were very, very, very close to Ghislaine wanted to impart to me that they felt she was a victim in this, that Ghislaine had maybe been naive. She was in love with this guy. She had no idea how deeply depraved he was. And Ghislaine was as much a victim of this as the girls. I just can't handle the fact that this woman is pretending she's a victim. I can't handle the fact that all these people come forward and pretend to be victims when the victims were children and young girls, young vulnerable women. I absolutely believe that the defense will claim that Ghislaine Maxwell uh, was a victim. She was under the influence of this very powerful, very wealthy man. He had a hold over her psychologically and that he abused her as much as he abused those girls. I have no doubt that they're going to try to use the non-prosecution agreement to defend Maxwell. But the non-prosecution agreement covered the charges and women in Palm Beach. The charges that have been brought in the Southern District of New York are separate and distinct. There are accusations these young women are making that they were paid to also be with some big names. Could she help to bring those names down for a more lenient sentence? Jim, that is the million dollar question. If I was the lawyer, my defense would be cooperation so that I could get a reduced sentence and have a surety that I would be able to live some of my life outside of jail. 10 years as opposed to 35 certainly allows her to see light at the end of the tunnel. I think it's possible that Ghislaine is going to give up something. If it goes to trial, the tapes are going to have to come out. And I, I think that too many important people don't want that to happen. So I think the Justice Department will offer Ghislaine Maxwell something that she can live with. It won't be 30 years. Maybe it'll be 10 years or 15 years, which is hellacious, but it won't be in a maximum security prison. She's a woman and she'll go to a low security prison. I suppose when you really think about it with hindsight, is there any huge surprise that Ghislaine has ended up where she is the brutal answer would have to be no, because 
the society girl that I knew at Oxford, who, as I say, never exuded any warmth, who had this cold, calculating, rather brittle manner, she had these strange traits of character, which we all know came from Robert Maxwell. Well, how are you, Beth? Just give him the message, please, and stop giving us a hard time. I think one of the reasons that Ghislaine Maxwell is such a compelling character is that she's she's both a victim and a possible conspirator, and so you can never let her off the hook. Have you spoken to Prince Andrew? I made a statement, thank you. But you also have to bear in mind the history of that family. You know, having that man as a father, I don't think any of the kids have ever fully escaped his shadow. So she's a complex person for that reason. I'm just really interested to hear what her version is there's always two sides to a story you know really how bad was it she has never shown any remorse i think it's disgraceful and these people are going to burn in hell i like to hope that we'll see justice in the case against galane maxwell when you look at the victims of cases like this these lives are ruined i think this is a story about money and how money works and I think this is how rich people get treated in legal systems around the world. These are the wealthiest people in the world, and they have the most power. There's only one way they don't get away with everything, and it's, that's if they're killed. So um, either she gets away with everything or she gets killed. And I think that's been the pattern. The victims are told, oh, now the truth is going to come out because now, um, you know, Epstein is going to be prosecuted in federal court. And of course, we know how that ended. It would have been great to look at him in court and say, you know, you hurt me, you took away my innocence, you took away my youth, but he took that away from us too. I want answers because I think we all deserve that. And I think the girls deserve that. I would like to see Gilan stay in jail forever. I'd like her to apologize for what she's done to me and so many others. It's so hard for people who haven't experienced these really, really powerful people to understand that we anticipate disappointment. We anticipate being hurt. We anticipate being manipulated. We anticipate being lied to. I haven't seen anyone held accountable.